prayer for Sunday, the 23rd of July. Whether you're joining with us live in the building or online, you are most welcome. Particular welcome to anybody who's visiting today for the first time. We hope that you feel very much part of our fellowship um, and that you enjoy worshipping with us. An extra special welcome to some new friends who have joined from, um, uh, who have been dispersed to Aberdeen and are seeking asylum. We hope that you are, again, feel part of what's going on here. Today is another special service in the life of the church. We've got the privilege of witnessing another number of people being baptized. Not quite the nine that I was aiming for, but we do have six which is extremely exciting. So those of us that are here in the building will get the opportunity to witness this live. For those of you looking at the recording or the live stream, unfortunately, you're going to miss out on this for a variety of reasons. There are copies of their stories, along with some extras of last week's, available on the communion table over by the organ for you to pick up at the end of the service so that you can understand a little bit more about the journey that these guys have been on. One other thing um, to note in church life, next week it's the fifth Sunday of the month, so the building will be set up a little differently. Um, We'll be around small tables here, um, drinking tea and coffee from before the service and even during it. So please do come along and enjoy learning together in a slightly more informal and relaxed atmosphere. As we gather, let's pray. King of all the earth, creator of the universe, holy God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. Your law brings life, Lord, and we meditate on it day and night. Happy are we when we walk in your ways. You are a rich stream of living waters, and we would immerse ourselves in you. Happy are we when we walk in your ways, Lord. You bring forth fruit in season and establish the work of our hands. Happy are we when we walk in your ways. Who is like our God, the one whose ways are full of life? Happy are we when we walk in your ways, Lord. This is our God, the Holy One. We come before you with thanksgiving and offer you our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rise if we're able and sing our opening song, a song that reminds us of many reasons that we have to praise God. Bless the Lord, O my soul.
please be seated. When I was younger, one of the, the sort of staple games at parties was a game called 20 Objects, where a tray would be uncovered and on it would be 20 different objects that you had to try and kind of memorize and then the tray would get covered and something would get taken away and you had to try and identify which object had disappeared from the tray. So I thought we could have a game of that this morning. If any of the kids want to come up the front and have a look at my tray, you're welcome to. Yep, you coming up, Jimmy? Ziva, are you coming up? Excellent. Olu, are you coming up? Right, okay. <clears throat> okay, there's 20 objects on the tray there, so you need to try and make sure you can memorize them all, okay? Make sure you can see them all. Make sure you've... Okay, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. I'm guessing you in the congregation think you're getting off easy on this one. Well, tough luck, because 20 objects are now going to appear on the screen, and you're going to have to do it as well but you're getting slightly less time to memorize all 20 objects, okay? So there's a sachet of sugar, there's a thermometer, there's a picture hook, there's a tea bag, a pen, a straw, there's a stapler, a candle, post-it notes, a paper clip, a notebook, a flower, a battery, balloons, sunglasses, scissors, watch, hand sanitizer, balloon, and a biscuit, all neatly in a wrapper. Okay, do you think you know all 20 objects? You think you do? Oh, we'll see how, how about the congregation. Do you think you know all 20 objects? Well, we're about to find out, right? I'm going to cover this, right? I'm going to take something off the tray. Okay, no peeking. You're not peeking, are you? Okay, right. There you go. See if you can tell me what's missing from the tray. And it's missing from the screen as well. If you can, right, bring it up. Flower. on the screen. The flower, is it the flower? Yeah. I don't know, does anybody else think if it's the, is it the flower that's missing? Yeah. It is yeah. the flower, well done. Right, okay, right. I'll give you another quick look, okay, because I'm going to take something else off, okay. So are you paying careful attention, okay? Is everybody else, right, we're going to cover it, right. We're going to do, 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 do. Are you looking at the screen as well, are you? Mm. Right, okay, something else is missing this time. What's it that's missing this time? Uh, the thermostat. The what? No. The thermometer yeah. is the one that's missing. That right, okay. Right. Okay, right, are you looking again? Right, okay. I'm going to make it really difficult this time, okay, because I'm going to jumble them all up so that they're no longer in the same place and it's all just in a big pile, okay? And we're going to jumble them up on the screen as well so that they don't... Uh, right, what's missing this time? Um, the... Um, mm. Sunglasses are there. It's the hand sanitizer that was missing. Way, it disappeared. Right, give them a round of applause for joining in there. Well done. Right, you can go and grab a seat. You can sit back down. Oh. Taking objects off the tray was a little bit as if they just kind of disappeared. We pretending they were disappeared, even though we knew all the time they were hiding underneath my tea towel. I wonder if we think a person could ever just disappear like that. Well, the sad thing is that in certain countries in the world, sometimes people do just disappear. We have people here among us today who have come to the UK because it's not safe for them to be followers of Jesus in their homeland. They could be arrested and beaten, as some have or even just disappear and never be seen or heard from again. But this morning we're thinking about somebody who disappeared in very different circumstances. Let's listen to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5, which can be found on page 1209 of the church Bibles. It tells us the story of someone who disappeared with a lot of help from God. The writer to the Hebrews says, 
By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Wow. Enoch just disappeared, never died. He was taken by God to be with him. Last week, we were reminded that Abel pleased God by giving his very best. In order to find out how Enoch pleased God, we need to go back to Genesis chapter 5 to discover the whole story of Enoch, which we're going to read this morning. We'll find it on page 7 of the church Bibles. It's in Genesis chapter 5. It tells us the whole story of Enoch which is actually only four verses, and those verses start at verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more, because God took him away. Amen. It doesn't tell us very much about Enoch, and that's because the whole purpose of this passage is not really to tell us the in-depth story of each of the characters that are mentioned. It's merely a record of the generations from Adam to Noah. No time for different subtleties in each person's account. No eulogy, just the bare facts. So, we don't know very much about Enoch. We know that God decided to disappear him from the earth before his earthly time was up. Enoch's the only entry in the list that doesn't end with the phrase, then he died. It's a puzzling passage in the Bible. It's strange. We might have expected more to be recorded, but nothing is. All we can really be sure about Enoch is that he walked with God. That's how he pleased God. That's how God, or that's why God commended him. It's so crucial to understanding who Enoch is, it's mentioned twice in the four verses. When that phrase is used in the Bible, it alludes to someone who's respectful, dedicated to the Lord, bringing about God's approval. It's important for Enoch, so important that we're told that he faithfully walked with God. To live by faith in the Almighty means that we develop our relationship with Him as part of our ordinary way of living. We respect God in the way that we make our decisions in each and every part of our life. Enoch's case may be strange in all of Scripture, but it sets an example for all of us to follow, to seek to faithfully walk with God. So, what is it about Enoch's faithful walk that we can learn from? We need to walk in God's direction. Some of the guys being baptized today have spoken about their lives before knowing Jesus as being aimless, without purpose. Enoch sets us an example of one that is full of purpose, of one that has a direction, that the way is marked, and it's God's direction. This is what it meant for Enoch, walking in God's direction. That's why he's commended. And this can still be true for us today. It needs to be true for us today. If we are to walk with God, if we are to follow Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, 
if we are to walk as Christ walked, then we need to follow Christ's, God's direction. We need to walk as Jesus walked. We need to live as Jesus lived. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we look for 12 disciples to follow our teaching. It doesn't mean that we try and perform supernatural, extraordinary miracles, because Jesus was special. But it does mean that we try, we intend to live as Jesus lived. We intend to follow Him as the guys who are being baptized today will commit to. We seek to apply the lessons that Jesus taught in our daily living, to completely submit ourselves to loving God and to the loving service of others. We walk in God's direction. But we also seek to walk in progress with God. As any parent knows, a child needs to learn to crawl, then walk, before they can run. A child needs to take simple steps first, then successive steps. Walking in progress with God means that we walk faithfully. It means that we seek to live by faith. We make it a habit of trusting God completely. Suffering comes and suffering goes, as some of the guys being baptized today will testify to. But we are to live continually with the encouragement that God is with us and refuse to give up our walk. It's something that I'm personally challenged about as I look at what it has cost these guys to follow Jesus. What it means for them, it's humbling and challenging. Paul tells us that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we learn to walk, to live, to think by faith in Him. We often think of works being vital for Christian life. But if we think of it as Christian living, we're reminded of what it means to walk with God. Our faith in God impacts how we live daily. Walking means that we're becoming more like God. Walking in His direction means that we're becoming more like Jesus. But we also need to be mindful of where it is that we're headed. Getting a specific destination, one that uh, means that we know where we're going. We know that we're headed in the right direction. We're prepared. But sometimes that means going out of our comfort, comfort zone. We can't always walk where it's easy, where it's smooth and flat. Sometimes it requires hard work. But if we know the destination, it helps us to persevere. For Enoch, it was a quick step to heaven. For the rest of us, it may take longer, and it may involve struggles along the way, as many of us can testify to. So I want us to think of two examples this morning of people who walked faithfully with God, though neither of them are known for their walking. The first is Eric Liddell. Now, for those of you who aren't Scottish, you may not know the name Eric Liddell. He was a very famous Scottish Olympic athlete who competed in the Paris Games in 1924. He was a runner, a fast runner. At the games, he was due to compete in the 100 meters, but the heats were going to be held on a Sunday. Eric decided that his Christian faith would not allow him to compete on the Sabbath. So he dropped out of the 100 meters, an event which was his best event. He was the British record holder at the time, but he would not compete. Instead, he entered the 200 and 400 meters. 
God commended Eric for his faithful walk. Not only did Eric win a bronze in the 200 meters, but he won a gold in the 400 in a then world record time. He later described his plan for the 400 meters in this way. The secret of my success over the 400 meters is that I run the first 200 meters as fast as I can. Then for the second 200 meters, with God's help, I run faster. It's part of Eric's story, which was immortalized in the film, Chariots of Fire. But Eric's faithful walk with God did not stop at the Paris Olympics. Some would say that his walk only got stronger and more faithful afterwards, because the following year, 1925, Eric returned to the land of his birth, China. He went there as a missionary, as his parents had been, and shared his faith there for many years. During the Second World War in 1941, the Japanese army were advancing on the area of China where Eric and his family were. So they fled to a rural mission station. There he was kept busy dealing with a stream of locals who came to the station for medical treatment and food. But even there, they were not safe. In 1943, the Japanese reached the mission station and Eric was taken to a concentration camp. Aggravated by a shortage of food and medical treatment, Eric developed a brain tumor, suffered severe mental health, uh, severe health issues while in the camp, but all of that only made his walk stronger. Many of the people in the camp speak of Eric's strong moral character as he lived out his walk with God. He was seen as a great unifying force. He helped to ease tensions through his selflessness and impartiality. Norman Cliff, one of the people in the camp, said this of Eric, the finest Christian gentleman it has been my pleasure to meet in all the time in the camp, I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. One other internee said this about Eric. He gave me two things. One was his old worn-out running shoes, but the best thing he gave me was his baton of forgiveness. He taught me to love my enemies, the Japanese, and to pray for them. Eric died in the concentration camp just five months before its liberation, but it was revealed after the war that Eric had turned down an opportunity to leave the camp in a prisoner exchange. He gave his place to a pregnant woman. His death left a profound vacuum within the camp. Such was the strength of his personality and character. This is what walking faithfully with God meant for Eric. And it's a challenge for all of us. The next example of someone walking faithfully with God is Joni Erickson Tada, a truly remarkable woman, injured in a diving accident at the age of 17. Joni has had to endure more physical suffering than most of us ever will. Just after graduating from high school, Joni had her fateful accident. It was a hot July day, unlike any we get in Aberdeen. She was away to meet with her sister Cathy and some friends at the beach on Chesapeake Bay to go swimming. When she arrived, she dove in quickly to the water and immediately knew that something was wrong. Though she felt no real pain, a tightness seemed to encompass her. She first thought she was caught in a fishing net and tried to break free and get to the surface. Panic seized her as she realized she couldn't move and was lying face down at the bottom of the bay. She realized she was running out of air and resigned herself to the fact that she was going to drown. 
rescued by her sister, Joni's life was changed forever that fateful July day. She'd broken her neck, a fracture between the fourth and fifth vert uh, cervical vertebrae. She was a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down. While all her best friends were sending out graduation announcements and preparing to go to college, Joni was fighting for her life and having to accept the fact that she would have to live the rest of her life in a wheelchair. She would never walk again. But she could still walk with God. Joni's rehabilitation was not easy. She was angry. She raged against her fate. She struggled with depression. There were times when she even wanted to end her life. She could not understand how God could let this happen to her. Before the accident, she'd felt that she wasn't living the life that she should have been, that she wasn't walking with God as she could have been. And she'd prayed to God that He would change her life, that He'd turn it around. It was after months of staring at the ceiling, wallowing in her depression, that Joni began to wonder if this was God's answer to her prayer, if her walk was going to be done from a wheelchair. And it was this realization that God was working in her life that gave her hope. It was the beginning of her journey to wholeness as a disabled person. She participated in various rehabilitation programs that taught her how to live with her disabilities as she immersed herself in God's Word to become spiritually strong. And her life has been a full one. She has learned how to compensate for her handicaps. She was naturally creative, so she learned to draw and paint by holding the utensils in her teeth. She began selling her artwork, and it was a great success. There was a real demand for her work, so she kept herself busy painting and drawing, gaining a degree of independence. She was also able to share Christ's love in her drawings because she always signed her paintings, PTL, which stood for Praise the Lord. She became sought after as a conference speaker, author, actress. She even portrayed herself in her film, Joni, the story of her life. She's written several books, including many children's titles. But for her, her most satisfying, far-reaching work is her advocacy on behalf of the disabled. She moved to California to begin a ministry to the disabled community around the globe. She sought to fulfill the mandate of Jesus in Luke 14 to meet the needs of the poor, crippled, and lame because she understood firsthand the loneliness and alienation that many handicapped people faced. She knew their need for friendship and salvation. She immersed herself in this ministry, calls for both spiritual and physical help for the disabled. She uncovered the vast hidden needs of the disabled community around the world and began to train local churches into how to effectively reach out to the disabled, those who were often overlooked. She had a heart for people who, like herself, have to live with disabilities. Her role as an advocate for the disabled led to a presidential appointment on the National Council of Disability in the United States. Though she had suffered deep depression, though she had lost the will to live in the aftermath of her accident, she gradually came back to a deeper walk with God. Because of her early struggles, her faith grew in strength, and she's a testimony to the world of how when we're weak, God is strong. 
because her story is not one of bitterness and despair, as we might imagine it to be, but it's one of love and victory as she's faithfully walked with God. For Enoch, walking with God meant pleasing God with his life. For Eric, walking with God meant giving up everything he had in the hope of even greater things through God. For Joni, walking with God meant experiencing God and His strength, especially in her weakness. For the guys being baptized today, walking with God means following a path of love, justice, and forgiveness. What will it mean for us to walk faithfully with God? How will we demonstrate that in our daily living? Let's ponder that for a moment or two in silence, and then I will lead us in prayer. Lord, we say we want You to walk with us, but we're not always comfortable with the path that is set before us. We would like a smooth, newly paved road with clear markings and bright, bold signs telling us what to do, warning us of what lies ahead. But the journey of discipleship is like a rough mountain path. There are rocks and ruts, dust and dirt, holes and edges. There may be wild animals, dangers at any turn. We don't know if we dare to risk discipleship, if it means struggle. But you have called us to rely on your guidance and direction. You remind us that you have never failed us yet. We've been brought to new vistas, new opportunities of service that we would never have encountered on the safe road. And this is because in all our trials, you walk with us, Lord. In our troubles and concerns, Lord, we need your presence and comfort. We have so many fears and anxieties. Our hearts break and are burdened with the illnesses and grief of loved ones. We hear the news of disaster and catastrophe in this world and wonder how much of this we can stand. In our troubles and trials, Lord, remind us that we have your strength on which to rely. As we have faithfully brought before you the names of loved ones in need of your healing and comfort, remind us that we too are recipients of that same healing love. Strengthen us, Lord. Walk with us, Lord. Lift us high and give us confident strides as we seek to follow your will and your path faithfully. Lord, give us faith to live out the prayer that Jesus modeled for his followers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
let's rise if we're able and sing a couple of songs that, the first of which reminds us of what it means to walk with God, that we trust and obey because there is no other way. And then as we prepare for the baptisms, we'll sing the splendor of the King.
Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. As I shared last week, back in the autumn of 2021, we, as a fellowship, took a step of faith in planning a baptismal service with no one lined up to be baptized. Today, we are not continuing the sequence of three, five, seven, but we have six gentlemen before us today declaring their faith in God. That means that by the end of the service, we will have baptized 21. It's definitely a God thing. This was not even within our wildest imaginations back in the autumn of 21. It's a sign that God has commended us for our faith in Him, our trust in Him. God is good. God is great. As a slight side note, I wonder what our next challenge needs to be as we seek to step out in faith once again. Answers on a postcard. But today, we're here to celebrate with some of our new friends. They publicly commit their lives to Jesus at great personal cost. We also have an opportunity to reaffirm our own commitment to God, our own walk with Him. For others, it may be that we have never taken the step of following in baptism. Maybe that's something that God is challenging you today about. Please speak to me. After all, Paul reminds us in his letter to the Colossians, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Following his resurrection, Jesus commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In obedience to Christ and in joyful thanks for God's redeeming love, we gather today to baptize those whom the Spirit has led to repentance and faith. Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, and still disciples are called to follow Christ through the waters of baptism, to be buried and raised in union with Him. Here is the grace of God washed free of sin. Disciples of Jesus are immersed into all that God has done in Christ and that He promises to continue to do through His Spirit. By one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body, patterned after the likeness of our Lord Jesus and anointed for His service. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus, who was baptized in the River Jordan and passed through the deep waters of death. We praise you that you raised him to life and exalted him. Send your Spirit, we pray, that these baptisms may be for your servants, a union with Christ in his death and resurrection so that as Christ was raised from death through the glory of the Father, they also might be raised to newness of life. Pour out your Spirit and anoint them for service, that they may grow into the likeness of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing the, the first verse of a, a great baptismal hymn, O oh, happy day, and we will sing subsequent verses between 
each baptism. Let's remain seated as we sing. moment we're going to sing our closing song, one that challenges us about our relationship with God. If you have been challenged today about your walk, then please do speak to someone. If you're interested in baptism, it would be great not to cover up this tank again for weeks and months, but to help you follow in Jesus' footsteps. Let's rise and sing our closing song. Thank you for joining with us today, for being part of this celebration. Please do come up and congratulate the guys after the service. Stay safe as you're leaving the building. Keep well if you've been joining with us online. May you walk faithfully with God in His direction, at His pace, for your life and your witness in His world.
let's close by sharing the grace with one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.